of the tennis players came over and he was yelling and he was really upset. Well, one of the pickleball guys came over and he started yelling some things. And next thing you know, we're going to have a fight on the, the pickleball court with a tennis player and pickleball player. In fact, one of the tennis guys, he's like, let's do this MMA style, mixed martial arts. Like, let's actually fight. Let's get a ring going. Let's fight right now. And I'm thinking, am I in the twilight zone? What is going on right now? And so these, these uh, tennis players start coming after this guy that had yelled at one of the tennis players. And so I'm like, oh, man. And I'm a total peacemaker, OK? And so I step in, step in the way of these guys. I'm like, hey, man, back off. But they said this. And I'm like, just back off, man. Just let's go back over there. Let's just calm down. And I'm trying to play peacemaker. And so we, we finally get the two groups separated. And, and I go back to my game, and they go back to their game, but there's one guy on the tennis courts that just keeps screaming like obscenities, and he's yelling at some of the pickleball, and he's yelling at the guy that originally kind of started it. And I had had my limit. I'm like, I am done here. And so I just stopped our game, and I went over to him, and I'm like, man, chill out. And he's like, don't tell me to chill out. And I'm thinking, this could go really south really fast. Uh, so what am I going to do? And so I just say, yeah, you just keep yelling, man. This guy's calmed down, and you you just keep yelling. And so I'm yelling at this guy. And thankfully, <laughs> he calmed down. Uh, because afterwards, it was funny because we're sitting around and I'm talking to some, some of the pickleball people. And you got to understand, like, pickleball for me is, is obviously a hobby, but it's a great way for me to be out in the community with people that don't go to church, building relationships. And so we weren't even talking about it. And this one guy goes, hey, yeah, man, when you were over there, I'm like, Billy's a pastor and he's about to throw down right now. <laughs> and <laughs> And he's all, but don't worry, because I've got your back. And I'm like, OK, thank you. And, and so um, welcome to a three-week series where I'm going to lead you on in, in integrity, you know? Uh, <laughs> but here's the deal. It's, it's like I went from being afraid, right? Somebody's going I, I, to be attacked. I might be attacked. I don't know what's going on, to I got to the point where I just hit my breaking point. I was angry at that point. I was still in control, but I was just telling them, knock it off, because I don't like bullies either. I don't, like you, I don't think you guys like bullies, uh, but there's a point sometimes when you just have to like, stand up. And, and as we talk about integrity, you know, uh, how do I lead that into to integrity? The reality is this, is that I'm not perfect, and so I, as I lead this into integrity in 2020, I want you to know as I speak about this, I'm not perfect, and you know, nobody is. There's one that's perfect, and it's Jesus Christ, and he's constantly giving us the strength to live with integrity. And you're asking, well, what, is, what does integrity really mean? Well, it means to be undivided or whole. It, it means that my, my private life matches up with my public life. In fact, Billy Graham has a great quote about integrity. It's a great de definition, really. Integrity means that if our private life were suddenly exposed, we'd have no reason to be ashamed or embarrassed. Integrity means that our outward life is consistent, consistent with our inward convictions. And so what I like to say is sometimes in our lives is we have a tendency to compartmentalize our life. And so we've got this compartment over here, and this is our family compartment. And then we've got our work compartment that we live in. And then we've got our recreational compartment. And then we have this area of our lives called social media and electronics and being on the computer. And this is a whole separate compartment. And then students, if you're in school, you've got your school compartment. And then there's this compartment that we have. It's, it's called church and God and his values. And so what, what happens is that we compartmentalize compartmentalize our lives and we end up be, being divided. We end up being duplicitous. It means that uh, these areas are not integrated, but what integrity is, is being integrated. And as a follower of Jesus, what we want is we want to take this compartment here, our church life, our relationship with God, and we want to infuse those values and his truth into every area of our lives. And that's what integrity means. It means I'm an integrated person that my private life lines up with my public life. And I don't have any skeletons in the closet. And I'm not trying to hide anything from you. And I'm living an authentic life. And part of that authenticity means I want you to know I'm not perfect, but I'm trusting the one that gives me the strength. And he's the one that's going to help me to grow in 2020. A good definition, a biblical definition of integrity would be Job. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of 
complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil, and he has maintained his integrity, even though you urged me to harm him without cause. And so you know Job's life. He experienced an incredible amount of suffering, and yet he continued to maintain his integrity. That word blameless there in the Bible doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean Job was perfect, but he realized his weaknesses before the Lord, and he was constantly dependent on God for strength to live the life that God had called him. And so why are we saying, let's go after integrity in 2020? Well, if you've ever talked to somebody that has compromised their values, they know the pain that's associated with that. You see, there's many reasons that as I was studying the Bible and looking through them, I want to give you five reasons to live with integrity in 2020. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. It's because I will please God. That's the very first one. I will please God. Now, God has designed life to work a certain way as we read his word and we learn about his morals and his values and his will for our life, we realize that he's designed life to work a certain way. Now, when we disconnect from that and we compartmentalize and we decide to go our own way, there's consequences for that. You see, when we trust God, we experience his blessing. And some of us, this is a mentality that I hear sometimes is that, well, I can go over here and do this because no one is going to find out. I can go in this private area of my life and it's compartmentalized and it's separated from all the other areas and I can kind of just compromise here. No one's going to care. But here's the thing. God sees it. God cares. And God is pleased when we live with integrity. Integrity. Proverbs 11.20 The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. And so those that live according to his values are seeking after him. He delights in that. He delights when our hearts want to serve him. But he, the Lord detests people with crooked hearts. There's a group of guys in the Bible named the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day when Jesus was walking this earth And the religious leaders were all about putting on a show for the people. And so they would pray these lengthy prayers and they would give so everyone could see them. And people admired the religious leaders and they looked up to them. But inside of the hearts of these religious leaders were full of lust and greed and resentment and jealousy and all of these things. And so Jesus would call these religious leaders out. And what he was saying basically is that your hearts are crooked. You put on this show. See, that's living a duplicitous life. In my heart, in my motives, it's not to honor God, but it's to elevate myself. So I'm putting on the show, but inside my heart, I've got all this junk going on. And so when we live with integrity, it pleases God. The second reason and benefit of integrity is I will be joyful. I'll experience more joy, more happiness, more peace in my life if I live with integrity. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. That if I follow God's will and his ways and I walk in his way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to experience joy. It's when we disconnect from his ways and his values that we experience turmoil in our hearts. I remember uh, years ago, I had bought a a jacket at a garage sale, and I bought it for $5. It was this big ski jacket. It was a great deal. And it was like in September. It was kind of the end of the summer. About four months later, around Christmas time, I'm driving in my car, and I just happened to unzip a little pocket that was in in the jacket. I reach in and I pull out $86 and a lift ticket. And I'm going, whoa, this is amazing. Like, and I'm so excited. I just 
received $86. And I threw the lift ticket away and kept the $86 and started thinking about all the things I can do with the money. I can take Elissa out to dinner. We can go have a nice day. I could put it towards my kid's college fund. Uh, there's all these things I'm thinking in my mind and rationalizing. And I'm going, God, you know, you blessed me with this money. But then I got this little feeling in my heart. I'm going, wait, that wasn't intended to be there. And that's really not my money. So then I started going, well, I, I don't think I, I know where I, I can't remember where I got this jacket and where I bought it from the house. And then the Lord quickly reminded me of where I bought it. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So for a few days, I'm wrestling in my heart as to, do I justify keeping the money because, hey, it's their fault and they shouldn't have, they should have checked the jacket before they sold it to me, or do I make the right decision and do the right thing? And so there's this inner tur turmoil in my heart for a few days. So like I said, it was around Christmas time, and at night I went, and I knocked on the door, and I found the house, and I said, hey, I bought this jacket four months ago, and I reached in, I pulled out $86 and a lift ticket, and she goes, she just, her jaw just dropped to the ground, and she goes, oh, we could really use that right now. And so I gave her the money, and it was just a really good exchange, and she was so thankful. And so as I'm walking back to the car, I hear these footsteps chasing after me. And I'm running, I'm thinking, like, that's all I had was $86. I'm trying to get in the car, like, get in the car, hurry. And she goes, no, 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 stop. She goes, she's waving a 20, and she goes, I just want to give you at least a 20. And I said, no, I, I, this is your money. And, and we're kind of going back and forth. And, and finally, she twisted my arm. I said, OK, I'll take the 20. Um, but, but it was such a, a really neat time. And I just remember that peace going home and being able to sleep at night and just sleep and knowing that I made the right decision. Now, there's no amount of money that can pay for that peace. Right? We think that money's the thing that's going to give us joy. We think that money's the thing that's going to help us to, to live a better, more purposeful life. And yet God says, no, I want you to live with integrity. And I'm going to take care of you. And you're going to be happier in the process. And I even, he even rewarded me in that process, too. And so you're going to be more joyful when you make those decisions. How does that play out in your life? Where you're at the cash register, and the cashier gives you back more money than you realize you you're supposed to have. What do you do in that instance? Do you say, well, it was their mistake and I'm going to go ahead and keep the money? Or what would integrity say? Integrity would say, hey, you know what? You actually gave me more money and I want to give this back. And you know what's cool is I shared that story about, you know, giving the money back and everything. And uh, people were just coming up to me after the service and sharing their stories. And I know how... And as they're sharing the story, they're sharing with joy. They're not regretting the fact that they, they made the right decision. They're going, man, I can't. And they're excited. Why? Because you're going to be joyful when you have integrity. The third, uh, look at this verse. Better to have little with fear for the Lord than to have great treasure and inner turmoil. That right there, Proverbs 15, 16. The third benefit of integrity is I will be protected. I will be protected. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. And you think, wow, integrity is actually going to protect my life? There's a story in the Bible in Daniel chapter 3. These three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're in a foreign land with a foreign king. And the king builds this huge golden statue and says, I want everyone in the land to bow down and worship the statue. But if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down to that statue, they're going to compromise their values and they're going to they're uh, disconnect from, from God, and basically disobey God. But the problem is, is that if they don't bow down to the statue, they're going to be thrown in a furnace and killed. And so this is what their response to that is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And so they've got this confidence that God's going to rescue them and protect them to make a decision. Now, they're going to be persecuted, but they're knowing God's going to come to their rescue. But I love this part of the verse here. Because we kind of, we go, well, th that's a promise, right? That God's going to come and rescue us. And this is what they say. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. 
No, it doesn't matter. See, you can kill us. We're going to serve the Lord. I mean, that's integrity there at its highest form. And what happens is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he orders the guys, you know, making the furnace hot to heat it up seven times hotter than normal. He wants Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to burn in there. And so he ties them up. And it says, the Bible says the guys heating the furnace actually die because it's so hot. The next morning, Nebuchadnezzar comes to check on the status of these guys, and he looks down, and he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they've, they're untied. They're walking around with a fourth person. And Nebuchadnezzar says, it's a person that looks like the son of man. And so there's four people in the furnace. Do you know who the fourth person is? The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. He's walking down with those guys, and he's protected them. What a beautiful picture. So Nebuchadnezzar brings the guys out. He's freaked out, like, I can't believe this just happened. And he goes, okay, everybody serve their God. And he promotes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, you can't make this stuff up because God is faithful. And it's integrity that will protect you. And so you're forced with the decision to stand up and have courage. and, And it might cost you everything. And yet you say, I know there's a God who's going to protect me in the midst of that. How does this also play out? Well, maybe just in your little decisions day by day, you ignore the advances of the opposite sex. And what does that do? It protects your marriage. Uh, students, you, you s- decide to uh, not cheat on that test when everyone else is cheating, and it will protect your reputation. You know, for you as a, maybe a, a man or a woman who's in the career field and, and you're, you're kind of going after uh, your career and wanting to succeed there, but there's a season of your life where you go, my family needs me right now. And so I'm going yeah, to say no to this promotion. I'm going to say no to more money because I'm going to protect my family and my kids. You see, when we live with integrity, it protects us. Think about young people. They're constantly being bombarded with drugs and alcohol and partying, and this is the way to live. But when you decide to say no to that, what are you protecting? You're protecting your body, and you're protecting your future. And so when we live with integrity, God protects us. May integrity and honesty protect me, for I put my hope in you. The benefits of integrity, we have, I will please God, I'll be joyful, I will be protected. Number four, I will be more confident. That when you decide to live for God, you decide to live with his values, and you integrate and infuse those values into every compartment of your life, now you're integrated, you're just going to live with confidence. Think about it. Mark Twain said one time, he said, uh, I tell the truth, that's, that way I don't have to remember what I said. Isn't that so good? Like, I don't, you know, people that are duplicitous and they put on a show and they're dishonest and they're unauthentic, what happens is that they live in this web of manipulation and they're always trying to figure out, okay, like, what did I say to this person? Uh, Does it line up? Oh, man, oh, I think I said here. And it's just an exhausting way to live. But if you're living with integrity and you're doing what God's called you to do, there's a sense of confidence. There's a boldness that comes from living with character. You know, I think one of the the things that chips away sometimes at our confidence is when we go through trials, when we go through difficult things in our lives, and it has a way of chipping away. And when you go through trials and you can continue to maintain your integrity and you can continue to live with character, what it's going to do is going to build your confidence. A great example of that in the Bible is Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, he goes to Egypt where he lives with confidence and, uh, and he lives with integrity and he works his way up to second in command to Potiphar who is a high-ranking official in the Egyptian government. And the Bible says that he literally is taking care of Potiphar's house. Well, Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph daily and wants to be with him. And there's one time when Potiphar is off on a business trip and Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph and says, basically, come and sleep with me and is pressuring him to do this. He says, no way. She grabs him. He runs out of his his coat and runs away. She's holding the coat. 
she tells her servants and, her, and, and tells everyone else and tells Potiphar that Joseph tried to make advances to her. And so Joseph gets put in jail for something he didn't even do. For two years, he's in jail, falsely accused. What does Joseph do? He continues to live with integrity. He continues to serve the Lord because there's this confidence that Joseph has that God is going to turn everything for good. And even though he doesn't see it yet, he's by faith believing that God is faithful. And so Joseph gets out. He tells a, uh, he pr- tells a dream that um, the Egyptian king had. And as a result, he works his way up to second in command in all of Egypt, okay? Now, Joseph was a wise person, and he was storing grain. And so Egypt had all of the resources so that the surrounding countries would come to Egypt for those resources. Well, guess who comes 20 years later? He hasn't seen his brothers that threw him into that pit and sold him into slavery. And so his brothers come, and it's this beautiful moment that Joseph forgives his brothers and provides for his needs and, and, and for their needs. And it's in that moment that he realizes, okay, this is the reason that I went through all of that suffering. Look at this verse. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He's brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. You see, Joseph had this incredible confidence and he kept his integrity. And as a result, many lives were saved. And God takes you and, and you go, God, uh, how do I have confidence in the midst of my grief and my pain and the trials that I've gone through? And we just keep walking this road of faith. Even, and that's what it is, because sometimes we just can't see it. But God sees it and we trust that he's going to do something amazing by it. And so you trust him. Look at this verse here. People with integrity walk safely. But those who walk crooked paths or follow crooked paths will be exposed. So what does that look like for you? Every time you decide to resist temptation, just like he did, right? Sexual temptation. It made him stronger for that moment when he was able to run away from Potiphar's wife. Every time that you decide, I'm not going to live with resentment and unforgiveness in my heart. I'm going to decide to forgive. Those are the moments that bring you confidence and bring you joy and give you strength. Uh, In those moments when you're in a, a personal prison, and in that personal prison, you're tempted to numb the pain through drinking and through drugs and through relationships and you just want to numb the pain because the pain is so difficult and yet you walk through the pain with God and God is so faithful. He gives you confidence. Let's see here. I will please God. I will be joyful. I will be protected. I will be more confident. And then the fifth benefit of living with integrity is I will leave a lasting legacy. I will leave a legacy. The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. Isn't that so true? That maybe you have, you're an aunt or you're an uncle. You're somebody that has influence. You're a, a father or a, a mother. Maybe you're a school teacher, but you've got people that are looking at your life and they're wanting to emulate your life. And they're looking at all the things you do, not only the big things that you do, but they're looking at all the small decisions that you make. Yeah, I remember when my son was four years old and I was uh, exercising and I had this exercise video. I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you, but since we're doing a, a message on integrity, it was called Target Toning for Buns and Abs, okay? So it was a good video of you guys. I can get you the, um, the video if you need. And so I, I'm doing this thing in the front room, and I'm exercising, and I'm watching the video, and I look over, my four-year-old son is mimicking every single move that I'm making. And I'm going, this is so cool. We're exercising, and then he asks me this question. He, goes, he says, Dad, is this going to make me strong? I said, yeah, buddy, exercising, all of this stuff, it's going to make you strong. And then he said, because, Dad, I want to be strong just like you. And I was like, man, dude, do you want to go to Disneyland? Do you want to go get ice cream? Like, dude, you're my favorite kid right now. Like, I'm just kidding. But I was just so excited to hear that. But but, but those words, 
I want to be strong just like you. And I, I, that, I realized at that moment that he's watching every move that I make. And every decision, every conversation, uh, behind closed doors, how do I spend my free time, uh, and, and, and trials, am I trusting the Lord or not? And he's looking at my life. And I'm going, wow, this is so huge. And that's, I mean, look at this verse right here. We have happy memories of the godly, but the name of a wicked person rots away. So you think about people that have had influence in your life. And you go, man, I just love that influence they had in my life. I was watching their life and they lived with integrity. As a result, that encouraged me to live a life of integrity. And so your integrity, see, we think that uh, the decisions that we make only affect us, and that's not true. You see, the decisions that you make affect the people around you, and especially those that are watching your life, the younger generation. And as we show them what it looks like to live a godly life, they are going to be encouraged to live that same life. Now, we know that living a, a godly life and living with character and making decisions to follow God, it's, it's tough. And let's just be honest here. We don't always do it right. And I'm sure that as I'm talking to you, some of you, the, the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart and you're going, I've been playing with fire in certain areas of my life. And he's calling, he's saying, I'm going to give you the grace. See, what we do is we go, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to be more disciplined. But you have to understand something. You can't change apart from God's grace. You can't change apart from the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so what he's calling, this is what integrity is. It's coming to Jesus and saying, listen, God, you already know this about my heart, but I'm going to admit it, that I've been struggling in this area of my life, and I've been dishonest here, and I've been looking at stuff on the internet here, and I've been talking to this individual here, and it's getting a little bit too, too intense and a little too emotional, and I've been doing this over here, and we just start getting honest with God. And you know what God does in that moment? He showers us with his grace. And when we experience his grace, his forgiveness, it launches us into this going like, I can live with integrity. I can live for God. I can make changes in my life. And so if you want to make changes in 2020, it's not about trying harder. It's about trusting deeper and trusting the one that can give you the strength. He's Jesus Christ. And so here's the deal. This is how he did it. He came to this earth and he died on a cross and he sacrificed his life in your place so you could experience forgiveness and grace so that you can live a life that brings honor to him daily. And so that's what we're going to do in 2020. We're going to look to Jesus Christ. We're going to look to God's word. We're going to learn about what he has for us. And then we're going to say, God, give me the strength in every area of my life that you would infuse every value, every truth, your will across the board in my life so that people will say this, wow, that guy, that gal, she lives with integrity. I can trust that person. And that person knows God. And guess what's going to happen? People will be drawn to you and ultimately, they'll be drawn to Jesus. And that's what we want to do here as a church. So let's pray together.